Welcome to Phenomenon Radio, the show that covers thought-provoking breakthroughs in the fields of UAP UFOs to discover fascinating truths, first-hand accounts, and investigative insights into the expanding confluence of physical and mental exposure to this worldwide phenomenon. Hosted by Emmy Award-winning investigative journalists, Earth Files reporter and editor, Linda Moulton Howe. And now, leading off tonight's program, here's Linda Moulton Howe. For this October 5th, 2017 Phenomenon Radio broadcast, we had UK best-selling author Nick Redfern scheduled to talk about his new release, The New World Order Book. But Nick has been struggling with a bronchial virus that won't let go of his larynx and lungs yet, so he is still coughing a lot with a voice that breaks up. We have rescheduled Nick for Phenomenon Radio Live on Thursday, October 26. So today, on this October 5th broadcast, I am going to go back in time to September 1st, 1979. That's when I began researching bizarre animal deaths that were making headlines as they had periodically for a decade or so. Much of my television work as director of special projects for the CBS affiliate in Denver involved stories about environmental issues. I thought perhaps I was dealing with a contamination story. Maybe the government had accidentally released some kind of poison into the land and was randomly spot-checking tissue from grazing animals to monitor the contamination spread. That was the context in which I began the investigation to produce the documentary film I came to title A Strange Harvest. But I quickly learned from newspaper files that the strange bloodless mutilations had been reported worldwide for a long time. Further, it did not make sense that the government would brazenly leave the carcasses to be discovered by a shocked public. Within a month, after talking with dozens of ranchers, law enforcement officials, and fellow journalists who had investigated the intense mutilation activity, especially in the peak years of 1975 to 1976, I heard one off-the-record UFO story after another. A Wyoming rancher said that an orange glowing disc the size of a football field had approached him one night in 1976 while he was watering a field of barley. That same year, the rancher found two of his cows bloodlessly mutilated. The description of orange or white glowing lights and or beams of light shining down from something silently hovering above pastures was a common theme among people that I interviewed. The documentary shifted from environmental contamination to an accumulation of human testimony that implicated the presence of extraterrestrial mutilators. Throughout my work, my definition of extraterrestrial, also ET, includes alien intelligences from this universe, other dimensions, and other timelines. After A Strange Harvest was first broadcast on May 25, 1980, I received hundreds of phone calls and perhaps a thousand letters from people not only in the United States, but coming to me from around the world with their own stories about encounters with strange lights and mutilated animals. I proceeded to work on another documentary called A Radioactive Water about uranium contamination of drinking water in a Denver suburb while the Harvest Correspondence files grew and grew. It was as if, as if each day I walked in two worlds, one without UFOs in it, and a parallel one in which UFOs were dominant. And today on Phenomenon Radio, Bill Skywatcher in the New York KGRA studios is going to ask me questions as I go back in time to the strangest investigations of my professional career. Beginning after this brief break in Walsenburg, Colorado, and the very first bloodless, trackless cattle mutilation of so many that I would come to investigate for months and years after. Hi. 
it's AJ with Vibes Mind, Body, Spirit. The Vibes Tribe seeks to assist you in creating and maintaining an uplifting and balanced state of being in your personal space. Palo Santo is a mystical tree that grows on the coast of South America. Palo is loved by many for its energetic cleansing and healing properties and is also popularized for its heavenly presence in keeping your energy grounded and clear. Burning Palo provides an uplifting scent to raise your vibration and is also beneficial for relieving stress, anxiety, depression, and emotional pain. Palo Santo is also known for relieving symptoms of the common cold, headaches, and asthma. We offer Palo Santo in resin, powder, or by the stick. Go to OnlineVibes.com for all of your vibration elevation needs and receive a free stick of Palo Santo with any online purchase over $25. Shop OnlineVibes.com, that's OnlineVibez.com, and get your vibes on today. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com I remember back in October of 1979, I had been working for about four weeks on trying to get to the bottom of what are all of these cattle, horses, goats, sheep, pigs, chickens, even cats and dogs. What is happening out in the landscape of Colorado and the West? And I was learning it was happening in Canada and other countries of the world that would leave an animal usually lying on either a right side or a left side. And if you took the typical cattle or horse mutilation, as you're looking at the sky facing head, neck, and body, there would be an ear, the sky facing ear would be cut out right at the skull in a perfect circle about the size of a quarter. You would come down to where the sky facing eye was, and there would be a perfect circle as if you made it on a compass or contractor in school. And there the hide would be removed down to clean, dry, bloodless bone. The eyeball, the eyelids, the eyelashes would all be gone inside of that perfect circle. Then you would come down a tiny bit more to the mouth and the jaw, upper and lower. And the vast majority had what looked like a keyhole of upper and lower hide flesh taken from the jaw very smooth, very clean, very bloodless. Inside of the mouth, the tongue would be removed deep in the throat, no blood. Coming down the body, male or female, female udder, that would often be taken in a big oval so the entire udder was removed or precisely half of the udder looking like the heel of a shoe on one side where the udder had been and the other half of the udder looking absolutely perfect as if it could function, but it was only half of an udder with no milk, no fluid, no blood anywhere coming out of anywhere on the udder. In the male, it would be a very clean, high deep only oval that would remove the penis in the testicles, and then in the rear of both animals, the female, almost 90% of the time, the vaginal tissue with the rectal tissue would be removed in a hole six to nine inches in diameter, penetrating into the body of the animal, usually about eight to 12 inches. In the male, it would be rectal tissue that would be also removed in a very dry, clean hole going into the animal. That is classic. And with that as my research starting out and having even in the first two weeks at the TV station, the CBS station where I was director of special projects in Denver, uh, a office where I was calling up people, having them come down to talk to me before I started with a crew to go out to locations one of those people that I asked was a Catholic priest 
who was famous in Denver back in 79 for doing exorcisms. And I had him come down to my office at KMGH-TV in Denver. And I had laid out on a table some of the photographs that I had gotten at that point from some sheriffs and ranchers showing the classic animal mutilations. And I simply asked the Catholic priest to look at these animals and to tell me, did he recognize anything about the patterns, the ear, the eye, the jaw flesh, the tongue, the genitals, and the rectum and vaginal area cord out? Was there anything about that pattern that he knew about or recognized in the history of uh, people taken over by something that the Catholic Church would exorcise? And he was in his black garment with that stiff white collar. And he went over and he started looking quietly at the photos. And he turned to me and he said, Linda, I've done a lot of exorcisms. And for what we deal with, quite often we are dealing with blood. And there's no blood here. And I don't recognize anything in these patterns that compares to anything that I have dealt with in exercising in the Catholic Church. So right there in the first two weeks of my research, I was hearing the elimination of what seemed to be a mantra out in the public that what was responsible for animal mutilations were satanic cults, predators, or disease. Those were the three that you kept hearing like a mantra. So knowing that I didn't have an answer, knowing just with the phone calls that I was talking to some ranchers who were talking about beams of light that they had seen coming from glowing objects in the sky, I remember my puzzlement. What in the world am I moving into here? Because my initial impression that it might be some kind of secret government project, it was beginning to deteriorate as a hypothesis amid all this high strangeness. And then came the first trip with my cameraman and my audio, and that was the epiphany. That was what tipped everything for me, that we were dealing with something that was beyond human understanding. My crew was Richard Lerner, photographer, Mark O'Kane, audio, and myself. We got in an airplane and we flew down south to Southern Colorado and we got into uh, an area called Walsenburg. And there we were introduced to some deputies who had just the uh, week before had been investigating an animal mutilation that somebody had called into the sheriff's office. And so the crew and I travel with the deputies out to this location. And now try to imagine that you're pulling up where there's tall grass. There's no easy access to anything where we were. We got there on a road, then the whole rest of it is we are had to walk quarter, half a mile. And we are walking through grass, and we can see in front of us tall, thick willows. We can see branches of a tree above the thick willows. My cameraman said to me, I wonder what it's going to be like trying to push this way through. And he's got this big, heavy film camera that we were using back in 79. And we get to the outside of these willows. And the men, the deputies and my uh, cameraman and the audio, they start pushing. And they are having to use real force to push their way through these thick, thick, thick willows. And I'm following my cameraman. And when we get to where this tree, this big tree with branches coming down on top of the willows is, he ducks way down. I duck down behind him, really not fully understanding where we are going but the deputies are leading and we're following. And the next thing I know, down as far as I can get underneath the branches that are going to the ground, 
forming almost like a tent of tree branches coming down on the willows in the ground. We come out in like a room built by this tree. And here is a black and white steer. It is lying on the ground. The tree branches are arching above our heads so high and coming down to the ground around us that the men can stand up underneath these branches. And one of the deputies says, Linda, this is how we found this animal. It's been here for a week. And he starts showing me, here's a perfect circle of the hide removed around the left eye. It was lying on its right side. The eye ball, eyelid, eyelashes are removed. There is a perfect keyhole excision of the tissue at the jaw. At the belly is a perfect oval. It was approximately six or seven inches wide and about three or four inches in an oval. It was the removal of the uh, penis and then coming back to the rear was this most perfect circular hole penetrating into the rectum. This is my very first close-up with one of these animals in this very confined space made by the trees and the willows. And the deputy said, Miss Howe, I'm curious. What do you notice in here that is strange? And as I'm looking at the animal on the ground and looking at the branches above, forming like an artificial ceiling above us, it hit me. There was not one broken branch, not in the tree, nothing broken on the ground. This animal was, rise, was lying on it like pristine ground. And I said that, well, how would this big 1700 pound animal get in here underneath all these branches without the branches being broken? Because how else could it possibly have pushed its way through those willows? It still would have encountered the wall of branches down to the floor. And the deputy said, that's exactly what hit us. Linda, however this animal got in here, it had to come from some place we think above but it could not have come through the branches or the willows within a week of that incredible start i was hearing from uh, ranchers who were knew i was now working on this documentary trying to get to the bottom of the animal mutilation mystery so i started getting phone calls coming into the station and I remember one of them was from a family, and they wanted me to know that they had had the experience of the wife in the ranch family uh, walking out to go get some supplies from a shed one night late at 10 or 11 o'clock in the night. It was out east in the ranch lands east of Denver. And all of a sudden, a light that it started out white as a beam and seemed to change to red, it came right down around the woman on the ground as she was trying to walk. And she was completely paralyzed in the light. Uh, she was panicked and terrified and the light let go of her. But this was uh, one of the ranches where there had already been mutilations in previous years. And the ranchers had already among themselves had begun to associate the appearance of round glowing objects, beams that could come down to the ground. And eventually I would hear to my face as I went out to see these ranchers, one or two of them had seen one of their animals either rising in a beam of light or being lowered in a beam of light. They were scared they did not go into the pasture where they were seeing the beam during the night hours. They waited until sunlight in both cases. Then they found the animal, their own animal, that was now obviously what was going up or in one case down in a beam, 
is lying there in the pasture, dead and mutilated, no blood on the excisions. And because I started hearing those kinds of stories early on, combined with what the deputies and my crew and I experienced in Walsenburg, Colorado, I knew that I was not in any kind of a normal investigation, my career. I graduated from Stanford University with a master's degree in communication. My documentary work there was with the Stanford Medical Center and with the Stanford Linear Accelerator. I was working, uh, doing a documentary on uh, preemie babies. I was doing, uh, my master's film was on uh, getting computers to analyze the bombardment of subatomic particles at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Everything that I was interested in and have been doing was hard science. I was used to looking for facts. I was used to verification by doing studies or having laboratory tests. So what began to be my huge priority? I have got to get one of these animals that is fresh enough to get tissue so that I can get it to a veterinarian for pathology. And here was another big problem. Because ranchers were afraid of being ridiculed if they reported animal mutilations, sometimes they would find an animal that might be still warm to touch. Sheriff Tex Graves in Logan County said that was one of the most amazing things to him as a sheriff, the back starting in around 71, 72, and then increasing in numbers up through 76 and 77. He said, Linda, we were getting three to four calls a day and some days, and these animals were all warm to touch, which meant we are arriving. These animals have not been dead long enough to cool down, and yet every single one of them had the ear, eye, tongue, jaw, genitals, and rectum cord out. And then with my wanting to try to get a veterinarian to do some kind of a necropsy on fresh, because you've got to have the tissue to a veterinarian in no more than 36 hours after death, uh, preferably 24 hours, and ranchers didn't want to report them. So I talked about this with uh, retired Sheriff Tex Graves. He said, well, I'll tell you another problem. On one of the first mutilations that I went out on in the early 70s, he said it was a large cow and her uh, excisions were perfect. There was no blood. I had never seen anything like it. There were no tracks around her body in the dust. He said, I called up the local veterinarian. I had that ver veterinarian come out and I asked him, I want to see the entire necropsy done right here fresh. I don't want anything to wait. I don't want any possibility that we are going to delay this necropsy. Do it, please, in the pasture now. And I've done the same thing myself. And it takes about four hours to do a complete necropsy on a large cow. And as the veterinarian is down on his knees and Sheriff Tex Graves is standing watching, the veterinarian got to a point. He said, Sheriff, I want you to take a look. And the veterinarian had one of his hands down in the chest. Remember, it's the veterinarian that is opening up the animal. There were no cuts, n nothing on the chest or in the chest uh, when they found the animal. This is now the necropsy. And he had the pericardium, which is a transparent, translucent sac that completely encompasses and protects the heart of a cow. Humans have pericardiums as well, protection around this vital organ, the heart. In a typical adult cow, you can uh, range something like seven inches by nine inches by 11 inches. These are huge muscle organs inside of grown cows. So when the sheriffs looked down and he is seeing this trans parent sort of shiny material on the index finger of the vet. The veterinarian said, Sheriff, this is the pericardium. It's supposed to be surrounding the heart. There's no heart here. 
and there is no clotted blood here. There is nothing in the chest. And this pericardium that I'm showing you, I have examined it with my fingers. There is no excision. There is no hole. How could this big heart in this adult cow have gotten out of this pericardium, out of this cow's chest, when there was no excision into the body of this animal anywhere near the chest? And then the sheriff said, that veterinarian looked at me and he, his voice sounded angry. And he said, don't you ever call me out on another one of these because I'm not going to stand up to a group of reporters and tell them that what has happened to this animal or any others is not possible in human technology. Well, that was really another big step for me to realize that the ranchers didn't want to go on camera. The veterinarians didn't want to go on camera. How am I going to confirm all of this evidence that I'm beginning to gather from people who have been there? Plus, I am beginning to see more and more of these animals. Uh, Walsenberg was the beginning, and I found myself going to many different types of animal mutilations and having a discussion even with a, a man in the U.S. Forestry Service who showed me black and white photographs of deer and elk that had been um, mutilated exactly as I was seeing in the cattle and the horses and learning that the same patterns of excisions were occurring on every domestic animal that you could think of, in addition, deer and elk. And today in 2017, I have had many cases on reindeer and on kangaroos in Australia with exactly the same bloodless excisions. This is a world wide phenomenon in two hemispheres. It has been going on, as far as I know, from the beginning of the 20th century, not just starting in the 1960s. And it continues to this day with patterns of exactly what I'm describing that I encountered for the first time in 79. But continuing right now, there's been a spate since 2002 uh, one of the official statistics in a combination of Argentina and uh, Chile that the uh, version of the Department of Agriculture in Argentina, starting back in 2002, said between 2002 and 2005 that they had had at least 3,000 reports of mutilated animals to federal, state, and local uh, authorities on exactly what I'm talking to you now. So it's ongoing. It's ongoing today. But now what I would like to do is to take you through some of the memories that I found myself stunned. It was like starting out on a path like Alice in Wonderland and coming to a mirror. And if you decide to go through that mirror, you haven't got a clue what's on the other side. But I felt like I could not not go through the looking glass mirror because all of the physical evidence that was everywhere that the crew and I were going of these animals and the testimonies of ranchers and veterinarians and law enforcement was that we were on a path that was taking us to something that we had never encountered before. But to look away or to stop because it was so strange, I couldn't do that. I am first and foremost and always have been a very, very curious and left brain kind of person. And I really, really wanted to find out what was doing this, to face it and report about it. So now, here is how strange some of the cases became. I got a phone call from a place called Cripple Creek. It's south of Denver, very rural, mountainous area. And the person who called me was the rancher. And this is because everybody knew that I was working on these investigations. And when my documentary, A Strange Harvest, was 
uh, first broadcast. It was a 90-minute special on May 25, 1980. It was featured in uh, TV Guide. It was featured in uh, interview with me in the Rocky Mountain News. Uh, there was a lot of uh, publicity about this documentary that I was producing to be a 90-minute special that would air uh, from 8 to 9.30 p.m. on the CBS station in Denver on May 25, 1980. So leading up to that date and after were all of these people that were reaching out to me. And so this is one that I'm sharing that goes yet another dimension in my mind about the same kind of impossibility of the heart missing inside of a pericardium, inside of the chest of a large cow without any surgical excisions on the outside of that body. But this is going to a little bit different angle. The owner called me and said, 48 hours ago, I had a beautiful nine-month-old stallion. He was the pride of my entire farm. We have a corral, the, the boards of the corral, the poles of the corral are 30 feet from the back door of our house. And that door that you go 30 feet to the corral is right in the kitchen. So when we're in the kitchen, we can look out this door and we can look at the horse and the, the other horses we had in the corral. And every evening at 7 p.m. and every morning at 7 a.m., since I had this young, young stallion from a baby, growing. I would go out and personally, I would feed this beautiful horse. And this one morning, which was when he called me, it was two days before, he said, I got to the kitchen and I looked out and I could see my beautiful stallion was lying. And in this case, this particular horse, I believe was lying on its left side. So the right side of the body was sky facing. And he said, I was so shocked because I had fed this horse only 12 hours before at seven in the evening and he was healthy and the horses were happy. And now it's lying on the ground and it looks to me like it's dead. And I ran and to the door and I opened, and I ran down the steps. I went through into the corral and he said, and I stopped. Linda, I can't believe what I was looking at. The rear of this horse, 12 inch diameter hole that was going in like a cone. He said it was as if something had the ability to take a cone shaped plug of the entire rear of my horse out. I was so astonished that I kneeled down he said, I took my fingers to inside of this big hole in my beautiful horse. And he said, it felt like sandpaper. It was so dry. Linda, what could do this? Where is the blood? How could this be uh, dry when it's taking out the entire 12 inch? And he said, I think it went 12 inches in a funnel into the horse. And then... He walked around to the head, the sky-facing left eye had turned a bluish silver, he said, sort of like satin or metal. And we, uh, I knew that that probably sounded like radiation, but after doing some research at the time, I found that that kind of metallic glassy, shiny surface on an eyeball, whether it's human, animal, it usually can be uh, linked to exposure to radiation. But the horse had been alive and well in this corral in this rural Cripple Creek uh, 12 hours before running around. And then the farmer rancher said, my wife, she said, the dogs, they sleep. They slept with three large dogs every night in their bedroom. And he said, the bedroom 
is right up against the same wall as the kitchen. You got the kitchen, you have a wall, it's the bedroom. Linda, the bedroom and the kitchen are the same 30 feet from the corral. We have our three big dogs in the bedroom. And my wife was reminding me, we never woke up. The dogs never barked. How could something have come into that corral 30 feet from where we were sleeping with three dogs that we trusted to be guard dogs and never a peep? What happened in this corral? And he started to cry on the phone. I have never forgotten that. And I realized that here I was sitting in my office in Denver, Colorado at Channel 7. I had been starting into this mystery with a lot of options and that there was nothing in any of my experience, education, academic or otherwise, in which I could even begin to answer that crying rancher's question to me. And I still think of it as one of those pivotal moments where I so wanted to be able to answer his question, that there was nothing that was going to turn me away from continuing to investigate animal mutilations. So as you go further now into my path, a strange harvest was broadcast on May 25th, 1980, and it was like a bomb went off. Uh, it was the largest rating in Arbitron and Nielsen, which they used at the time, of anything that had ever been uh, broadcast of a produced, like a documentary or any kind of a show uh, on the CBS station. Since then, it hasn't been exceeded either. The Mailroom started dragging gray duffel bags full, full of handwritten and typed letters about a strange harvest. And remember, this was, I started the research in September of 79. I worked 18 hour days without one day break for nine months. And the broadcast was uh, on May 25th, 1980. At that time, there are no computers, no faxes. The only way we communicated was with landline telephones, uh, telegraph, or uh, mail that would be typed or handwritten. So in all of these duffel bags that were being dragged into my office with all of these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters, somebody had to type it or hand write it, or cursive. And as I began to open up all of this correspondence, and then there were all the phones, uh, the switchboard couldn't keep up with all of the phone calls coming to my office either. And generally, this was what everybody was saying. I've never told anyone this before. And then I would be reading about missing time, more animal mutilations. A, I remember an insurance salesman in Denver, very successful. He called me. He said, Linda, my mother-in-law and I saw the most amazing thing. I saw your TV show and it reminded me. He said, we were just watching the kids play in the front yard. And all of a sudden it looked like a very low, he said, that's what caught our attention, a very low black silhouette of a helicopter approaching so low that it alarmed me because my kids were playing out front. And he said, this helicopter kept coming, coming. Uh, the mother-in-law and he are watching and it came right over the front yard and they had called the kids to them before it got there. And then he said, and he drew this for me in the letter that he first sent. And then we followed up in a telephone call. He drew what they saw the black helicopter that made not one chopper sound was completely silent, transformed right in front of them into a square. He said it was a perfect dark square. And the square started rising vertically up in the sky, and then it transformed 
into a silver disc, and then the silver disc just popped away. He said it wasn't like it flew away like an airplane. It just popped out, and we saw this whole transformation, both of us. That I remember as being the very first time that I was introduced to the concept that I could be dealing with some kind of a phenomenon that could shapeshift any way it wanted to, and that that then went to other reports that I had gotten one from a physicist. Uh, well, he was a he had a physicist background, but his real degree was in engineering, and he worked at Sandia Labs in Albuquerque, and he called me. And he said that on a trip, a business trip, going from Albuquerque up to uh, Sterling, Colorado, in that area on something that the Sandia Lab was doing, you come to a place when you're going on the freeway outside of Denver, there comes a stretch where you will be paralleling a railroad track. It's that way today. And he said, so he's on the freeway headed north. And there is that railroad track. And he said, I realize there are two boxcars. And they're right there on that railroad track. And there is no sign of any kind of an engine that can move those two boxcars. And he said he began to think, oh, my God, there's going to be some horrible crash here. And he said as soon as he thought that, And that he's thinking that he's going to have to get off the freeway and get to a telephone and try to get in touch with some authority that something has happened on this railroad track between Denver going up north to Sterling. And these boxcars are there and there's going to be a horrible catastrophe. And that's what he's thinking when he saw the two boxcars begin to rise up together in the sky And they got to a point, he pulled the car over to the shoulder in total disbelief at what he was seeing. And then the two boxcars just popped out. And he said, what else can I conclude, Linda, that we have something around us that is projecting images that the human mind cannot discern as being different from what we would see as normal boxcars but the whole aberration of them being there without any way to get them off and then having them rise up into the sky and disappear. He said, it's as if something is playing with us, cat and mouse. I remember that as being one of those pivotal moments. And since then, the next that sort of fit into that category, one of the sort of spooky spooky mysteries of the animal mutilations that haunts me to this day. It was uh, in Elizabeth, Colorado, where there had been a whole series of animal mutilations intensely uh, for several years. That was one of the places in Colorado that had repeated animal mutilations. And I had gone to Elizabeth, Colorado to meet with a deputy sheriff, Bill Waugh. And Bill and I sat in his house, and this is what he told me. This would have been in 79, and the occurrence of what he was describing had happened about three years before in 76. They had all of these animal mutilations, and the sheriff had asked Bill Waugh and another deputy to start doing night watches in areas of pastures where there were these repeated animal mutilations. And he said, we had gone out to a very specific area where we were going to uh, watch and we're going down. He said it was a dirt road and the deputy and he at the same time yelled to each other, look, and coming at them, He said it looked like a a ball of fire. He said, think of exactly the colors of a fire. Think of what looks like flickers like a fire. And maybe, he said, I'm not sure how big it was, but big enough to fit somewhere in the category of maybe three or four feet in diameter. And the thing was, both of us, the deputy and I, we both realized it's coming so fast it's going to collide 
with our car because it is so low. And he said they both yelled uh, some uh, words that meant roll out. And Bill Waugh said he hit the door handle, but he extended his right foot onto the gas pedal, off the gas pedal, onto the brake, and that as his deputy colleague was rolling out his door, he was trying at that last minute before whatever this fiery thing was to collide with his front window. He was trying in his last seconds to bring the car to a halt as he rolled out onto the dirt road. On their backs, on the ground, to their astonishment, they could both see that whatever this orange fiery ball was, it came right to the front window and did a 90 degree angle and went off. When they stood up, they're looking around in the environment and Bill said, and next we're looking in the trees at this intersection where we just rolled out of the car and in these trees, there is a red glowing square, maybe about 12 or 14 inches square and a very deep red. And and we said, let's get out of here. And, and he said, I admit it. We were scared. We were shook up. Uh, we said, let's go home and we'll come back out here after the sun is up. So in the morning, they come right back to where they knew they had been. And Bill said, there are all of the body prints of where we rolled out of two sides of that car. There are the uh, prints of the car uh, sort of sliding into uh, the shoulder on the road where he had hit the brake. And then they both looked to see if the red square in the trees was still there. And he said, Linda... It, it hit us like a crash of bricks. There weren't any trees there. There had never been any trees there at that intersection. Something the night before with that orange fiery ball made us see that which was not there, like a grove of trees with this red glowing square. And he said, one of those questions that I have always wanted to answer. Linda, what technology are we dealing with here? What can make a forest with a red light that is shaped like a square when we had a fiery ball, which we thought was going to collide with our car, and we roll out on the ground, and we're looking at the hard evidence of our bodies in the car in that dirt road, and there's no forest, and there's no red square. What? are we dealing with? Today in 2017, I can say that I have walked so many miles now in these investigations that I have listened to people who are whistleblowers in the government who have also been trying to back engineer technology that they say is extraterrestrial, off planet, and that one of the technologies that is associated with this advanced alien intelligence interacting with our planet is the projection of three-dimensional holograms that the human mind cannot discern as being uh, anything except the solid matter world around us. That these, like the boxcars and the square and another man who saw an oil barrel rise up in Texas right out of a land and, they, and the oil barrel went up in the sky and disappeared. To the human mind and eye, they think we're looking at a real oil barrel, real box cars, a real glowing square, and yet all of them can move or disappear. And that if there is a technology that is that advanced and it's been being used around the planet, how long? And what is the agenda? And why would something from somewhere else with all of this ability be coming to this planet Earth and harvesting what is why I called my film and my book 
A Strange Harvest is my documentary. An Alien Harvest is my book that was written 10 years later. And by then I was convinced we weren't dealing with anything that was attributable to Homo sapien. We were dealing with something that falls in the category, as government whistleblowers say, an alien intelligence that has been interacting with this planet for at least 270 million years.